Wayne Barrett is a legend, but he's the legend. He is the iconic New York muckraking reporter. Wayne, to me, represented a reporting model. He was dogged. He was a great reporter, and he went after issues that nobody else was pursuing. Wayne Barrett has been tracking Trump for decades. His 1991 biography just republished as an e-book. It's titled Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. I named 25 mob associates of Donald Trump. It's so ridiculous for him to call himself a self-made guy when Fred's was critical at the political end, too. I mean, everything that came to Donald came through political connections, and they were political connections forged by his father over decades with Brooklyn uh, politicians. It's ironic, isn't it? This is a guy who, like, was one of the great practitioners of local investigative reporting, and New York City was his bailiwick his entire career. But right here in New York, he managed to focus on the man who he identified before any other reporter as being a really good, target-rich candidate for stories, Donald Trump. The next Wayne Barrett will be some young kid, you know, who has, and, and I run into them all the time at CUNY Journalism School, you know, people who are really great diggers. Uh, my name's Caroline. I'm a reporter with one of the local papers, The Bay News. Hi. Come on. Come so you, you think people who are getting sick in the area, a lot. It, it's probably connected to Coney Island Creek, you to the what? sewage that's going I can in there. find out, but I'll tell you one thing, a lot of people get sick. We're here pretty much every day. She's always in the water. She's always swimming. She goes from, like, shore to shore. So I never, you know, I have noticed when I do let her in, if she spends the entire day here, she will get diarrhea. Back in October of last year, the Beach Haven apartment complex, there was about 16 different apartment buildings that had an illegal sewage hookup to Coney Island Creek, to uh, two pipes that flowed right directly into the waterway. And that's dumping 200,000 gallons of raw sewage per day, potentially for years, into this waterway. And, and people had no idea. And the state discovered this in uh, September and wouldn't have told people, people wouldn't have found out unless environmental advocates leaked that information to one of our publications and you know, really started shedding light on this issue. I, I'm hoping that one of the reasons why we're not seeing as many people here today is because of some of the information that's out there and people are aware of this. But a lot of the times you still see people out here fishing, you know, because it's not just fishing for fun, they're fishing for dinner. Locals didn't know. People who swim, who fish, who, you know, it's connected, but Gravesend Bay is connected to Coney Island Creek, and there are people who literally have baptisms in that water. And these are people who had no idea that oil was going into an inlet where they get some of their food that's on their plate when they go to, you know, sit down and have a meal at a restaurant. From speaking with the state, the EPA, the U.S. Coast Guard, from the local congressman, Dan Donovan, no one is saying that anybody has legal obligation to tell locals that 27,000 gallons of oil spilled into a public waterway. This oil spill, you know, I would say that's probably a pretty bipartisan corruption story. Wayne's first approach to every story was to read every clip that had ever been written that had the name Bayside in it, right, just for starters. And if he did that, which he, which he would do that, he would find about the history of Bayside's, you know, past unsavory connections to various people who worked there over the times, the accusations even under the administration of Rudy Giuliani about what was going on down there. I wrote some of those stories myself when I was at the Daily News. 
and then he would go from that to looking at like the history of oil slicks and oil spills in that area of Brooklyn. You know, one of the interesting things about that story is that I don't think it's made a big citywide splash any place unless I've missed it. And yet, you know, 25,000 gallons is not nothing. So, you know, that just shows how crucial local news is. Anybody who's like digging into that story would look at the players. You know, you look at Bayside, you look at the uh, regulators to see whether or not they were doing their job. You look at the agency enforcement or whether there was some. You know, you would go through all those different levels. I spoke with a few different people at Bayside when this first happened. I spoke with different workers, and eventually I spoke with the owner. I'm going to keep talking to regulators, uh, talking to legal experts, you know, a, a lawyer with Riverkeeper, you know, who, who is, specializes in this kind of, of law, uh, and just, you know, trying to suss out what regulations exist that should have prevented this from happening. That quote from Wayne Barrett, where he said that journalists are detectives of the people always really stuck with me. I studied Wayne Barrett when I was in college and graduate school, you know, his, his column in The Village Voice, and that was something that they really strove for us to emulate, to be meticulously thorough in our reporting, in the documents that we go through, and the people that we talk to. Wayne Barrett, who's at a weekly, he had the lead time to not just react to a story, but to think about what it means and to go deeper. And you know, he could take that longer vision and not just be in a, in a completely reactive mode, which is um, what so much news media is now. We met Caroline at a Columbia Journalism School job fair, and she really impressed me. Wayne Barrett was not, he did not spring forth fully formed from the forehead of Zeus. He started out as a young reporter, um, working alone, uncovering good stories, pulling these threads, and when they started hanging up, he would just pull harder. That starts with these young reporters working hard and pulling the threads. At a weekly, sometimes something will happen and you have four or five days before you can get it in the paper. And sometimes the dailies will cover you know, these, these things. And so you have to think about the second day story. You have to think about what it means. You have to extend the basic narrative of, it's not just, hey, this happened. It has to be, this happened and here's why.